Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who loves guitars, Cadillacs, and hillbilly music. He is my friend, the captain. Yeah, but beer never broke my heart. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling your mother. Today we are sipping on Campfire Stout from High Water Brewing in sunny California. Garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. They used chocolate malt, added graham crackers to the mash, and added a natural marshmallow flavor, ABV 6.5%. And this week our fridge is full thanks to our good friends. First up, a big cheers to Rebecca in Orlando, Florida. And a nice chib to Ryan in Jacksonville, Florida. Next up, we have Diana in Middletown, Delaware. And a big shout-out to Eric in Lorraine, Ohio. And a little shout-out to Sheila in Lower Lake, California. And last but certainly not least, we have a cheers to Jessica in Richmond, Indiana. Thank you to everybody for putting some beers in the fridge for this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. Yeah, and while you're there, sign up on the mailing list. Go to iTunes, give us a five-star review. Check out our bonus show, our weekly bonus show called Off the Record. There's a link on the website, or you can check that out on the Stitcher app. That's on Stitcher Premium. And also, our old episodes are exclusively on the Stitcher app. And that is enough of the biz. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. I must honestly say, after reading the Bible and the Holy Quran, I started to wonder on the battle of good versus evil, on heaven and hell, in which many believe is a spiritual battle within oneself, and not an actual physical presence. Some believe that evil resides in all people, the yin and yang, for example. Certain things happened to me in life that I considered evil, yet they were perpetrated by those who were supposed to be the good guys and role models. The things they did are considered wrong to their own way of thinking. So why did these things happen? Did I do anything to these people? No. But I am crucified. While they are accepted, and this is taken as a consequence of life. So I looked at life and the ruling class and the so-called powers that be. I began to read books and studied them, keeping thoughts to myself until I could no longer keep it in. I came across what many would find such as conspiracy theories and secret societies, but this again crucified me as a paranoid, or even worse. Shouldn't these people be suffering a state of hell and not me? These are quotes from an e-book titled The Luciferian Theory. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the case of the Malibu Creek murder. On Thursday, June 21st, 2018, Tristan Baudet and his two daughters set out for a weekend camping trip. They were accompanied by Tristan's brother-in-law, Scott McCurdy, and Scott's two young sons. Their destination, the Malibu Creek Campground, located inside Malibu Creek State Park. This is a huge park of 8,200 acres. The park has 15 miles of trails and is located in beautiful, low-crime Malibu, California, just 25 miles from Los Angeles. 
The park itself is pretty famous. It contains the set for the iconic TV show MASH and was also the site for filming of the original Planet of the Apes. And many famous movie stars live in the area. Will Smith's $43 million compound is nearby, and the Kardashians are also not far from here. All right, can jiggy with it. The campground in the park is located near Las Virginias Road, which connects Calabasas and Malibu. The campground has 63 campsites, each with a picnic table and fire ring, rented by the night to people looking to enjoy the great outdoors in this scenic area. Yeah. So on that Thursday morning, Tristan and Scott and the kids, they headed up to Malibu Creek Park, arriving by early afternoon. They were assigned a campsite at the gate, but upon arriving there, they decided that they could do better. They scouted around, found a different area that they preferred, and requested a change at the gate. They set up their tent, cooked dinner, and put the kids to bed in their sleeping bags. Tristan and Scott talked late into the night, and according to Scott, they then retired in their separate tents where their kids were already sleeping. There are reports out there that on the night of Thursday, June 21st, 2018, 60, 60 of the 63 campsites were occupied. So the campground is almost full. Yeah. At 4.44 a.m. on Friday morning, now June 22nd, a 911 call came into the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department reporting shots fired in the 1900 block of Las Virginias Road. We don't know who called 911, although I've seen reports that it was Scott who heard the shots, then found Tristan bleeding and called the police. When the police and paramedics arrived, they found Tristan Bodette. He had been shot. Now, the early report says he suffered a gunshot wound to his upper torso. Unfortunately, there was very little that paramedics could do for him. And just a short time later, he was pronounced dead at the scene at 521 a.m. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, Lieutenant Rodney Moore, told the media that the man who was shot had been inside a tent with his two daughters when he was struck. The girls, thankfully, are unharmed. They were taken to the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station in the company of their Uncle Scott. Sheriff's deputies woke other campers in the campground, inspecting their tents for weapons, and asked whether anyone had heard or seen anything strange. Many didn't have anything to report. A few reported hearing three or four loud bangs, which they thought were from some distance, and then going back to sleep. Investigators closed the park so they could conduct a thorough investigation of the events of that early morning. They did not have a lot to go on, and they told reporters that no other information was available to give them at this stage. They had no suspect and no known motive. But one thing they did know, this was a homicide. What a strange set of circumstances. Here's a father. He's 35 years old. He's a young father. He's camping with his daughters. And and the fact that he is murdered, nobody else in the campsite seems to be affected. As, yeah, not, not even an injury as far as we could find. Yeah, and, it's like, what's the motive? There's no signs of robbery doesn't make any sense yeah his, so his two girls they were sleeping with him in that same tent their ages at the time were two and four but from what i could find their names have not been released to to the public or to the media mm-hmm. now tristan what we know about him he met his wife erica Wu when they were in high school in fresno tristan was clean cut and solid he loved cooking ultimate frisbee I guess he played on a team called the Air Squids, which is a pretty cool name. Mm -hmm. He loved nature, outdoor activities. Obviously, he's out camping with his young daughters. He likes snowboarding and biking and science. In fact, he was a scientist for his profession. After high school, he took a year to study in Switzerland, and then he matriculated at UC San Diego while Erica was at Stanford. Well, it seemed, like I said, it seems like an all-around pretty cool guy. And then 
fact that he's taking his daughter's camping. Yeah, cool guy, uh, good father, and smart, obviously, is what we can see here. Right. Once he graduated, he was awarded for the highest GPA in his graduating class. That is an award I've not received. Uh, he was enrolled at the graduate school at Berkeley, where he received his PhD in chemistry. So, as you pointed out, Captain, as I pointed out, one bright dude. The two got married in 2008 and settled in San Francisco, but moved to Irvine. Erica began an OBGYN residency, and Tristan took a job at a pharmaceutical company. In June of 2018, so just shortly before this murder, the couple was one week away from a move back to the San Francisco area. This would be so that Erica could begin her tenure as a practicing doctor. And Tristan actually accepted a job with a Bay Area pharmaceutical company. So they had plans, plans to move. Erica, all she had to do was pass her medical boards, and then she was good to go. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why Tristan took the girls camping. Erica needed to be alone and focused. She need to study, needed to study for these medical boards. Well, with no clear motive, you got to think that law enforcement is wondering where where she was during these events and was there any type of relationship outside of the marriage. Well, here's what we do know. On Friday, June 22nd, this is at 6.45 a.m. So the 911 call comes in at 4.44 a.m. Tristan is pronounced dead at 5.21 a.m., and this is now 6.45 a.m. Erica Wu was up and getting ready to go and actually take her boards, take the test. To her surprise, even at this very early hour, she found her sister Priscilla at her door. Priscilla was there as she had the unfortunate job of delivering the terrible news. Right. After they spoke, Erica and her sister made the long drive to Malibu to the Lost Hills Sheriff Station. This was to retrieve her two daughters. Erica, of course, was in a daze. She could not wrap her head around what had happened. It was just supposed to be a short, fun camping trip. And this wasn't in some remote, treacherous, or even threatening environment. This was a public park with some of the priciest residential areas in the world nearby. Well, and like you said, it was almost completely full that day. Yeah, 60 of the 63 campsites were occupied. To everyone, this murder seemed totally random, and it seemed very bizarre. The whole, the whole public opinion and theories, they were starting to get tossed around pretty quickly. Okay, here's what we were thinking in the very beginning. One, there was a thought that this could be an accidental shooting by one of the daughters, or a possible suicide. Mm -hmm. Now this was a theory, but this was ruled out almost immediately because the police found no gun inside the tent with the girls and Tristan, no gun at their campsite, really no gun anywhere for that matter. Right. Another thought was this could be a hunting accident there. We should note though, no hunting is allowed in this area at all. Right. There are some more complicated theories that were tossed out there and some of these well we'll go through them. first was Tristan's murder was somehow related to the marijuana growing farms operated by the Mexican cartels in this area this was tossed out there this was a theory though that there's there's just really no evidence to carry this theory any further wait are there actual marijuana fields out there there, there are farms that are operated by Mexican cartels in that general area, yes. Hmm. The other thought was, as you kind of hinted towards, Tristan was killed by a family member or someone he knew. Well, it just seems so odd to have three people in a tent and only one of them is murdered. I agree. And with the thought, too, that there's no other injuries, no other attacks it seems like this would be a very pinpoint uh, targeted 
attack. One also seems to like when you think about stranger motive, we could assume it's not sexual because he, he's a he's a male, but then they're they're camping. So what are they stealing if the motive is robbery? And then there's the other possibility that I would think that oh well he here's this man uh, camping with his daughters that maybe kill the father and t- and kidnap one of the kids. Mm-hmm. But that didn't happen either. Well, regarding this theory, they were able to prove very quickly in their investigation that Erica, his wife, was nowhere in the area right. at the time. And they were also able to rule out Scott. Now, we know Scott is along on this camping trip, but we don't know publicly. They've never stated why. They just simply stated Scott did not do this. I believe that, that you got a, several things. One, no evidence that Scott had any type of firearm. There's no evidence that he had any kind of gunpowder residue on him. Right. I think that would be the first test that they would give him. And as we said, it's believed that Scott was the one that called 911, that found Tristan, that that, that made life-saving efforts yeah, but we've seen it in the to past. To his brother-in-law. Where, where somebody's actually responsible for the murder, but they're the ones that called 911. So that wouldn't rule him out. Right. This other portion is quite complicated, and this would be a targeted hit with Tristan being the target. This theory really started to gain some traction. Tristan's work at Allergen was thought to be a possible motivating factor. Tristan, I show him as working on a protein-based anti-cancer vaccines and drug delivery systems. Mm -hmm. People wanted to know, could this be why he was killed? It was reported that he held numerous patents as well. Maybe somebody wanted the rights to his discoveries, Right. Or perhaps he was working on something top secret. You know, your mind really starts to wander when you hear these things here, because you could, we could be talking about the rights to lucrative medications at stake. Yeah, I understand that. And I don't have the knowledge firsthand, but I would assume that if somebody owns a patent on something, uh, on something they discovered that that would go to like next of kin like or, transfer over you would think for a time period yeah you you yeah. would think maybe even for the amount of the the patent itself right um so these conspiracy theories were really making their way around the internet people wanted to know did someone see killing him as a way to personally benefit mm-hmm. the theory here like some of the others that we that we've already discussed is not ironclad. Obviously, we mentioned several different versions of the same theory. But one major problem is something we've already pointed out in this story with with it being a targeted hit. Right. The fact that the brothers, the brother-in-laws together, they switched assigned campsites at the, the guard station. It doesn't really build in. Well, then I guess you could look at it on the other side. Was there somebody out to kill Scott? And got the wrong guy. No, they. I don't mean that they switched with each other. They switched completely to a whole nother campsite. Okay. So what I'm getting at is for this to be a targeted hit, a couple things would have to take in place. One, the offender would need to know that they were in fact going camping, mm-hmm. would then need to know that they switched campsites. Basically, what I'm saying is if somebody... I think the better word is moved campsites. Moved, thank you. You're correct. If somebody, if this were to be a targeted hit, everything to me points to that somebody would have had to have been watching him, watching his movements, stalking Tristan. Yeah, I'm no professional, but I, I think to it doesn't make a lot of sense if you're going to have a hit to play it out this way. I mean, I understand that the park might make a little more sense to carry out a hit, but being with his daughters and being with you know his, his brother, I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So as the investigation into Tristan's murder continued, there was more information that was coming out. Tristan's brother, Dylan Baudet, 
was named by LA's KCBS TV News as the source for its report that Tristan's tent was found to have two holes in it, one on the top of the tent and the other on the side of the tent. Police would not publicly acknowledge that these were bullet holes, but that's where your mind goes, right, Captain? Yeah. So here is where I start going, well, maybe there is something to this targeted hit theory. If someone I knew he was going camping, it wouldn't be difficult to watch him. This is an area where Mm -hmm. you, you could probably blend in. I don't know how you're staying there without the without bringing the proper equipment with you in advance or, or remaining to blend in even late into the night, possibly having Rangers there, you know, knowing that you shouldn't be on the property. Yeah. And so the thing is with these holes, with the bullet holes, well, they're not saying that they're bullet holes. There are two holes in the tent, one on top, one on the side. You think if somebody is trying to hit a target from any kind of distance, that it becomes very tricky to actually hit your target when you have three people inside of an enclosed tent. You're not going to be able to see your target. You're not going to be able to distinguish your target from the other two people in this tent. So so any shot from a distance seems very strange, and it it makes it seem like it's a random act, that it's not a targeted hit. The other problem, though, is when we see the hole on top of the tent, that to me looks like it could be a targeted event. I don't know the specifics, the the very details of this tent, but just thinking about tents I've owned in the past, there are some that have like mesh tops or, or an opening up at the top. If this were a smaller tent, you could walk up look down inside and aim at your target. Especially even if at night you could, you could use a flashlight to assist you in this. Well, I, I think if these holes, we'll say they're bullet holes, if they were coming from similar directions, I could see maybe the idea of, you know, an accidental shooting. Right. Or a hunting accident or even maybe a crazed hunter that decided to shoot into tents. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they're coming in from different angles, that's strange to me. Well, and I think that's why it's important that police did not publicly say that these were bullet holes. We don't know for certain that that they were. We're assuming that one of them had to be unless he was shot from inside the tent. But the the issue here being that we don't know exactly how fast Scott responded to what he heard, but it sounds like he acted very quickly after yeah. hearing the noise. He found Tristan very quickly. We don't have him as seeing anybody fleeing from Tristan's tent. So, again, this is... Th- it's just a very weird situation and a weird investigation. And I don't want to go to see CSI on everybody, but you would think they would be able to do ballistic tests to see if the roughly what range possibly the, the bullet went through the tent. Yeah. Well, and I, I believe they would be able to determine that they were in fact bullet holes or if right. only one of them was that, that that would be the case. So, this is this is a perfect way to lead us into some more information that, that would come out. And this was big for the case. This came directly from the L.A. County Coroner's Office from Assistant Chief Ed Winter. He said Tristan was killed by a single gunshot. So if the holes are thought to be bullet holes, unless one missed their mark, only one could actually be a bullet hole. The twist in the story here, Captain, is the assistant chief Winter says the single shot was to the head, not the torso, as was previously reported.
All right, we're back. Cheers, me mateys. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to everybody out there listening. I do want to point out before we get too far along that really great coverage for this case was conducted by the Los Angeles Times and by a long-form article in GQ magazine by Zach Barron. We have relied heavily on these sources in putting together this week's case. Now, everyone agreed Everyone publicly agreed that Tristan's murder was a bizarre incident, not easily explained, and early on thought to be an isolated incident. But just five days after the murder, that was going to change. Because on June 27, 2018, a story in the Los Angeles Times by Richard Winton would change everything. The B1 page article headline was, Five park shootings in two years, but no warning. The article cites five separate shootings, all in the Malibu Creek State Park in just a two-year time period, all before Tristan was shot and killed, of course. Yeah. The other shootings, in which at least one person was injured, got little publicity at the time, but now prompted fears that they might somehow all be connected. And the story got worse. On June 30th, the Times reported that there were even more shootings. And then again, this information was largely unreported to the public. Mm -hmm. The Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, the, the paper said, had identified seven other shootings in the Malibu Creek State Park area since 2016. Three of the seven were in Los Angeles Sheriff Department's jurisdiction, and the remainder were in the state park's jurisdiction. A LASD spokesperson issued a statement saying, quote, homicide detectives are aware that there have been other shootings near the location in the past. However, there is no evidence that suggests this incident is related to any prior shootings, end quote. Mm-hmm. The Times stated that the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department acknowledged these previous shootings only after the Times went ahead and published stories regarding two of the shootings. The Sheriff's Department announced that the campground area would be closed indefinitely for a safety precaution. Sounds like they were a little late to the game in closing the park. Right. And yeah, and they just. It seems like they kept this quiet because of the area it's in. Um, it's an area that people have some power. It's an area where people have some money, especially with so many being in, inside the park. You would think mm-hmm. there would be some kind of um, warning to the public that this is happening. Be on the lookout. A swim at your own risk kind of situation. Yeah. At the very least. And there's not, like you said, there's not a lot of injuries, right? There was at least one injury. Well, we're going to go through these, okay? Okay. So we can try to determine actually what's going on here. You know, is there a sniper hiding in the hills taking aim at unsuspecting park goers? So the dates of the previous shootings were published by the LA Times and are as follows. November 3rd, 2016... Then, through, then six days later, November 9th, 2016, January 1st, 2017, June 8th, 2017, July 22nd, 2017, July 30th, 2017, June 18th, 2018. This last one, June 18th, just four days before Tristan was shot and killed. Yeah. The tricky thing here for me, Captain, is I understand that this falls into two different jurisdictions, but some of these are so close together in time frame that it's hard to believe that that somebody wouldn't have recognized that there's a problem here, that that there's a very big underlining, we don't understand what's going on problem here. Yeah. Let's go through the ones that we have detailed information on. The The first incident was on November 3rd, 2016. This is when a young wildlife biologist, James Rogers, was sleeping in his camping hammock in the nearby Tapia Park area. This is not a campground. 
It's about 200 yards from Malibu Canyon Road. He says he, quote, heard a loud bang and then felt a burning sensation in his arm. This is quoted in the L.A. Times. He didn't see anyone around, but his arm was wounded, and after a time, pellets started leaking out of the wound. Oh, God. James noted that when his hammock, he, you know, he, when he's in his hammock, he sleeps with his arm or arms up over his head. Yeah. If, if he hadn't been positioned this way, he would have been shot in the head or the face. In the face. Yeah. In the face. He required surgery to remove the many pellets embedded in his arm. Then just two months later, in January of 2017, a woman named Melise Tatangelo, she was camping with her boyfriend in her Honda SUV inside the Malibu Creek State Park. The two were asleep in the vehicle when she heard a loud noise. This is around 5 a.m. They stayed inside the vehicle, but later got up around 6 a.m. They're going to go out and get some coffee, take a drive. While they're driving, they can hear something rattling around in the back of the vehicle. When they got out, they found a hole through the back hatch of the vehicle. Someone fired a shot at the SUV. And part of a shotgun shell was in the back of the car, right near where she was sleeping that night. Wow, heavy, heavy sleepers. Melise, she, she said that if the bullet had been an inch or two higher, then she would have been hit. The campground host said that others reported what sounded like a gunshot sound around 5 a.m. Now, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department deputies, they guessed that the shot was fired from about 20 feet away from the vehicle. Melise later told GQ magazine that the Sheriff's Department deputies were called to the scene of her shooting. They didn't really pay any regard to forensic evidence. They were walking all over the place on potential footprint evidence. They didn't take any photos. They weren't wearing gloves. She never heard from any of those deputies again after filing the report. That's pretty ridiculous. She says, and and it seems this way to me, that no one was really interested in her story until after Tristan's murder. Four other shootings occurred. Now, there's less information available regarding these, but we'll go through what we have. According to the Times on November 9th, 2016, this is just six days after James Rogers' shooting, someone shot at a person sleeping inside a car at the Malibu Creek State Park campground. Six months after that, on June 8th, 2017, a car driving down Malibu Canyon Road was struck by a bullet. Another car was hit on July 22nd. Then on July 30th, the Times reported, quote, deputies investigated another report of shots fired, but were unable to determine what happened, end quote. Then on June 18th, 2018, a Tesla driving, traveling along Malibu Canyon Road around 4.30 a.m. was hit. Someone shot at the car. No one was injured. Tristan Baudet brought his daughters to that campground just three days later. The troubling thing here, Captain, for me is not only are we seeing some of these occurring, some of these shots fired occurrences within a relatively quick succession of time period that you should be able to realize that there is something bad going on here, something very dangerous to the public going on here, but we also have similar occurrences. Right. We have people that say, I am I was sleeping and I was shot at, or I'm driving my car down this same road that somebody else was driving their car down and they were shot at. A couple of things that we can assume is that if it is the same person, this person knows the area pretty well. It's not that afraid to get that close to the victim. You know, some of the shots only being 
what do they say, 20 feet away? The, yeah, the one that we have evidence of public statements of would be 20 feet from the vehicle itself. You're you're almost close enough, especially if the shooter walked past the vehicle. The shooter very likely knew somebody was inside the SUV. Right. It might, might have uh, crept up to the vehicle or a tent and then backed away from it. Uh, but this person also hates naps. <laughs> he hates, and cars. Hates naps and cars. Yeah. Well... And, and this is to put it very lightly, needless to say, residents in the area were super troubled by the notion that it appeared that there was a random shooter stalking around the park. Based on what I know on like the, we had a 270 shooter here. Yeah. Which 270 is our outer belt around Columbus. And so to me, there there's a, there's a mental thing going on here. There's mental illness possibly. And so... That's what that's what's scary. Well, we can somewhat understand what the people in the area were were going through and what they were feeling. Yeah. Because, you know, these people are telling the press once they figure this all out, once it's all reported, that they're afraid to hike. They're in the area. They're afraid to go to the park. They're afraid to ride horses. Mm -hmm. They say some of them saying they felt like sitting ducks. Now, we felt similar when there were shots being fired at random cars on 270 here in Columbus when you're traveling along in your in your vehicle mm -hmm. there were there were injuries there was at least one murder that I can remember yeah what was interesting was you had all these shootings going around 270 but it's mainly the southwest side and all those exits are the exits that I would take to go to friends house go to work come home so it was very scary and and then there was several i think it's uh shootings that happened uh when people were going uh, on the on ramps mm -hmm. so you want to talk about going you have to take this exit and as you got on, on that on on ramp then your your nerves were shot you know you'd be sweating well, and I remember when that was going on, people would jokingly say to one another, oh, don't go on 270 or, oh, I stay off of 270. But in reality, even though they're trying to put on a, a hard shell for everybody, they were avoiding 270. They were avoiding these areas. Yeah. At one point there was, they believe like a cross section and um, a little bit before they caught the guy, but it was 270 and state route 23. And I remember m missing my exit one time and having to take that exit. Wait, you worked right in that area. Didn't yeah, you? and so I was, I was going a different way home, and you know, to and from work, I was going a different way because they said here's this cross section. So it was just like, one, well, why take the chance, right? Yeah. And so I was going a different way, and I, but I mix, I, what, what do they call it? Your, your, your muscle reflex, like I, I it just wasn't paying attention yeah. and, and didn't go my alternate way that day. And I, I remember driving down 23 and just like sweating going, Oh my God, am I going to get shot? And and then I could just see the interview. Uh, I was taking a different way and I just forgot that day. And then that's when I was shot. Right. So, I mean, we know firsthand what, what the public, the general public here, what their fears were, but their fears in this situation, we're only going to get worse because yeah. after Tristan's murder, the shootings that the public is now aware of, they continued media reports emerged that in mid July. So this is just a, this is a month after Tristan was killed. There were at least two reports of shots fired in the area on July 9th. And then again on July 12th, both occurring at night. And since June 22nd, there had been several other reports of possible shootings, according to the Malibu Times, as many as nine reports of gunfire. But Sheriff's Lieutenant James Royal said deputies did not find any proof that those were actual shootings. Three of the reports turned out to be something other than gunfire, including a backfire. One was a transformer explosion. Well, but at least you have people on the, the alert now. Right, right. 
which which you didn't afford the public that that safety net before. Right. And now they're on high alert. Some of these were, in fact, shootings, but this is how aware everyone is now. Any loud noise could be a shot. Yeah, and, and don't fall asleep and don't take a nap. And my clap there was not very loud. That was supposed to be <laughs> much more theatric than that. It sounded never, like a finger snap. And every time you hear a loud noise. Lieutenant Royal emphasized that the public needed to stay vigilant, saying, quote, I strongly encourage you to trust your instincts. He said this at a town hall meeting that took place in August, saying that if you see something that doesn't feel right, if you have a gut feeling, please trust it. The Malibu City Council advised residents to avoid the area in the early hours of the morning since it seemed the shootings were occurring in the hours between midnight and dawn. Right. Complicating things further was the discovery of two additional bodies in the park area. On May 16th, 2018, the body of Francisco Ronaldo Cruz, age 52, turned up in a ditch on Las Virginias Road. This is near the campground, close to the Malibu Hindu Temple. He died of blunt force trauma to the head and sharp force injuries to the neck and chest. According to sources who spoke with the Hollywood reporter, Cruz's body showed signs of torture in the form of drill marks. Then on July 27th, where were the drill marks? I don't know. Say, well, well, we, we do know that the report states that there was sharp force injuries to the neck and the chest. Drill marks on the neck and the chest. That's So that would be my guess, yes. Wow. On July 27th, 19-year-old Roger Chavez Barajanas, his decomposed body was recovered on an embankment in the 24,000 block of Payuma Road. He died of multiple gunshot wounds. The Sheriff's Department representatives said that these homicides, after their investigation, were gang-related and were not not connected to Tristan's murder. Officials specified that the remote canyon roads, unfortunately, have been dumping grounds for bodies for a very long period of time. But keep in mind, people in the area you're not very trusting of your public servants right now, are you? Yeah. You you weren't you don't feel that you were adequately warned about safety potential injury or or homicide due to flying bullets in the park or campgrounds. So you can imagine that these people are not going to feel super great about you coming forward and going, "Well, they're this is not connected." Yeah, don't worry, guys. Don't worry. It's it's gang related. Don't you have nothing to worry about. Basically, what you have here is hysteria in the area. At least as far as some media sources were concerned. In Touch, which is a weekly gossip magazine, questioned, quote, is there a new serial killer terrorizing the affluent community of Malibu Canyon? Another mainstream media pointed out that a 21-year-old man named Matthew Weaver had vanished on August 10th, 2018. This is not far away in Malibu. His four-door BMW was found, quote, hanging off the edge of the Topanga Mountain Motorway. Another disturbing case was the 2017 disappearance of Elaine Park, The 20-year-old was last seen leaving her boyfriend's home in Calabasas, and her car and personal belongings were found on the Pacific Coast Highway near Coral Canyon Road in Malibu. And, of course, one of the area's most well-known unsolved deaths was still fresh in the residents' minds. This is of Matrice Richardson in 2009. Right. Matrice, as you might recall, was a case we covered in episodes 75 and 76. She was detained at the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station, only to be released into the night with no car, no purse, no phone, and was never seen alive again. Right, it's it's 
another example of the incompetence of law enforcement in this area. Her body was found seven miles away down a wooded hillside. Her cause of death could not be determined. In August of 2018, officials from five different law enforcement agencies held a town meeting of sorts. Lieutenant Moore acknowledged that they had no theory, no suspect, or answers regarding Tristan's murder. The $35,000 reward for information did not serve to bring anyone forward. The Los Angeles Sheriff's Department would not even address whether they believed that the shooting of Tristan Bodette was targeted or random or whether there were any perceived patterns to the shooting crimes themselves. The autopsy results were sealed and detectives would not disclose whether any of the other shootings involved the same type of weapon. They would not discuss ballistics at all. They stated that they didn't see any connection between these crimes and the Matrice Richardson and Elaine Park cases. Sheriff Jim McDonnell told the San Francisco Chronicle that the pattern at this point certainly is not clear if there is one at all. After all, close-range shootings like Melise and Tristan are quite different from Tesla's being shot on Canyon Road, and that in turn is quite different from missing persons and drug cartel hits. If you're looking at your podcast app and you're wondering where can I find more True Crime Garage Go get the Stitcher app. It's free. Our show has been around for almost four years. So we got a lot of stuff in our back catalog. It's all available for free on the Stitcher app. And also, we have another show called Off the Record. Everybody loves it. Check that out on Stitcher Premium. Until tomorrow, everybody out there, be good, be kind, and don't litter.